to another academic video. My name is Leah, subcommittee of the academic and research team of MDSA. Today, we will be commencing our third episode of CBL Case-Based Learning with Experts here at Thay Orthodontics. Joining us today, we have Dr. Kong Shen Ern. After graduating from Penang International Dental College with his bachelor's degree, he furthered his studies at King College London to obtain his master's. I'm now at Thay Orthodontics, so let's go meet our expert, Dr. Kong. Good day, Doctor. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so lucky to have you here on board with us. Thank you so, for inviting me. How are you feeling today? Yeah, feeling good right now. All right. So, um, before we get into the topic, would you please tell us a bit about your background and how you got into orthodontics? All right. So, uh, I graduated in PIDT in 2011, and then I worked in the government sector for three years, and then went on to private practice. And then in 2017, I did my postgraduate. Uh, in orthodontics in Unity of Malta, which was twinned with uh, King's College of London for three years. And once I returned, I started my uh, private practice of orthodontics around uh, the Clang Valley area. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Doctor. Yes. I have heard that you have some interesting cases to share with us. So without further ado, shall we get into that? Yep, yeah, sure. Yeah. So for the first case, would you please tell us a bit about it? All right, so uh, for the first case, this is a case where I'm presenting a, a case where she is actually a 20, uh, late 20s, where she has a missing central incisor, and then she actually came because she, she wants to improve her aesthetics. So uh, we actually started orthodontic treatment for her to actually uh, make space uh, or to make her look nicer to, uh, so that she has a more symmetrical smile. Mm -hmm. So the two one was it congenitally missing. All right. So uh, one of the two two one was uh, was not congenitally missing. Uh, it was it's quite rare to get a, a missing central incisor. So she had a trauma when she was younger, and so that's how she lost her tooth. And uh, when she was younger, uh, orthodontic treatment was not something that uh, her family uh, will, 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 will will seek. So she now she started working. So she wants to improve her aesthetics. That's why she came for uh, to seek for orthodontic treatment right now. I see. Thank you. So for the next question, how did you plan out um, and the spacing and how did you distalize the 1, 2, 1, 1 until 1, 3 so that the veneer can fit in? Okay. So aesthetic-wise, uh, looking at her, uh, she doesn't when she smiles, she doesn't look very symmetrical because obviously she has one missing teeth. So our orthodontic aim is actually to make everything as symmetrical as possible. So we actually discussed uh, several treatment plans. One of the treatment plans is, of course, uh, to open up a space for the uh, central incisor, which uh, makes everything very symmetrical. But uh, one of the uh, disadvantages of that will be you'll be subjecting her to a prosthesis, either a bridge or a denture or even an implant on the front tooth. So we came up with several di uh, uh, different treatment plans. And this treatment plan which we came up with is... Uh, masking the lateral incisor, that means we're using the lateral incisor to actually replace the central incisor. Uh, and one of the canines will be replacing the lateral incisor then. So we are masking, she still has a natural teeth, uh, but sh we have to remove one premolar on the upper right side because we have to make space to correct the midline. So talking about space requirement, how we actually plan the space, uh, first of all, we actually need to discuss with a general dentist or the prosthodontist who is doing the case for her because we are masking the teeth. Uh, to, uh, so if you want to get a very good aesthetic outcome, uh, they are the best person to consult first before you start the case. Thank you. I think it's a very interesting approach that you took in this case mm -hmm. uh, to instead of using a prosthesis um, but to maintain the patient's teeth. Yeah. It's quite interesting. Um, so what is the retention plan for this patient? So retention plan in, in most of the uh, orthodontic cases, uh, we will be using what we call a vacuum form retainer or a clear type of retainer. So in this case, uh, because she has, uh, 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 oh, we have opened up the space and then she was actually planned for crowns and veneers to replace and make her smile more aesthetic. So uh, a fixed retainer will not be a very good option for her because uh, the fixed retainer wouldn't stick really well. So in her case, we just use the upper lower uh, vacuum form retainer to maintain the space. I see. Thank you so much. Um, 
practice. This is a postal related case. There is a question that the students want to know, and that is um, since we know process is generally the last piece of the puzzle in like uh, treatment planning, what if a patient came in already with a prosthesis like a crown or uh, a bridge and wanted to do braces? What is the adhesive technique you would do use in that situation to uh, cement the bracket onto the prosthesis? Okay, so very interestingly, you said that uh, it is the last puzzle of piece of the prosthodontics, but we usually involve them early on in the treatment because we will need their input to actually know where to move the teeth and how to move the teeth uh, because ultimately they will be doing the processes so if we don't have a good discussion with the prosthodontist then our treatment plan or the final aesthetic outcome won't be very nice uh, talking about uh, how would you bond brackets on a prosthesis so usually if it's the last tooth the molars or even the premolars, the easiest, most straightforward will be putting a molar band or a premolar band. However, if the front tooth is involved, if we want to try to put a bracket there, uh, we, there are several techniques. Uh, for example, we need to roughen the surface with sandblasting, and then we can put uh, acid etch with a different type of acid, which is hydrofluoric acid, uh, to actually make it stay there, the bracket stays there. But in many cases, it still does fall out. There is a risk of that. Uh, if the alternative is if you're going to change the crown anyway, we can plan for a, a, a provisional prosthesis, which can the bracket can at least stick much easier. I see. Thank you so much. That was actually one of the like the burning questions from mm -hmm. the students, and so thank you for answering that. Um, with that, we end the first case, and okay. so let's move on to the second case. Yes. Doctor, would you please brief us about it? Sure. So for the second case, this is a, a patient in her late 30s. This is a female patient uh, who came with a complaint of her teeth are not straight, but her overjet is a lot. She has a 9mm overjet, and she has uh, very crowded teeth, especially at the bottom, and uh, she has several teeth which are pro prognosis as well. So uh, orthodontic treatment was planned and done for her uh, on an extraction basis so that uh, we try to maintain uh, as much healthy teeth as possible in a case. So in a case, we actually extracted the upper lateral incisors and we extracted a lower premolar and one uh, first molar in a case. I see. So um, what made you determine the prognosis of the molar as a poor prognosis tooth and how do you classify uh, poor prognosis? Okay, so uh, prognosis-wise, uh, if you're looking at the x-ray of this patient, the six is, uh, is there's no structure over there. So of course, when we talk about prognosis, we're talking about cavities, we're talking about feelings, how close is it to the pulp. And if you have the option of taking out a healthy tooth, and you have the option of taking out a tooth which has a very big decay. Uh, the, the, the safest choice or the, will be taking out a teeth which of, of poor prognosis, which won't last her a life long. Because if you keep a healthy tooth, chances are if she keeps the teeth properly, she would be able to uh, maintain it or, or stay there in her entire life. I see. Thank you, Doctor. So since the extraction of the 4-6 and the 3-5 would lead to unequal spacing in her 3rd uh, and 4th quadrant, uh, what is your advice for closing unequal spacing? Okay, so closing unequal spacing, so that's where your knowledge of orthodontics come about. So it's about how we actually play about with anchorage. So one of the most common techniques is of course you use a, a more unit of teeth to pull a less unit of teeth. So, so uh, for example, you use all the teeth from the incisors, the premolar, to pull one molar in front. That's one of the, the most common principles or technique. Secondly, of course, you can use what we call in, uh, inter-arch elastics, uh, which is used most commonly used class two or class three elastics, where patients wear it to help your anchorage uh, control or anchorage uh, uh, balance. And of course, in the third, uh, way of how we're going to do it will be placing what we call temporary anchorage device, uh, which is what we call commonly bone screws for the patient to actually help to pull the teeth forwards if you are dealing with uh, unequal spaces. I see. Thank you for sharing that, Doctor. That's very um, comprehensive, I'm <laughs> sure. Uh, 
audience would like to uh, would be very interested to know this. Um, what about um, for the extraction of one one uh, and one two? Why did you advise extraction? Okay, so uh, looking at the X-ray, uh, like I say, if we want to plan something, we would remove a teeth with a poor prognosis. So in her case, uh, if we see one of the lateral incisor, it's actually root canal treated, and the root canal treated is not done in the in, in, in the best manner. So we chose to remove one of the lateral incisor, and to balance it because we want her to look symmetrical, we chose to extract the lateral incisor on the other side as well. And in this case in particular, it is actually uh, very advantageous for her because she has 9 mm of full jet. So by extracting something more forwards, it's actually advantageous in our mechanics because we can easily reduce the, the object quite easily. I see. So it was a matter of symmetry and also um, how convenient it was in this particular situation? I would say it would be a matter of uh, removing a poor prognosis teeth again and in her case, symmetry and also uh, uh, mechanics of the treatment. I see. So, um, you mentioned that the case was referred to you by a general dentist. Why is, um, in general, why is a patient referred to an orthodontist and why only referred for a consultation um, and not the treatment? Okay, so this patient is actually referred to me uh, because the case was a bit uh, complicated in the sense that she has multiple missing teeth, uh, multiple prognosis teeth, and the teeth was crowded, and the overjet is uh, uh, nine millimeters, which is quite a lot. But in general, why do you re uh, what case do you tend to refer? You tend to refer a lot of more complicated or complex cases, cases that you think that you are not able to handle. And how do you think that the case is complicated? Uh, you need to know your treatment plan and your diagnosis of the, the, the case to actually determine whether it's complex or not. A lot of cases, if you miss out on uh, the, the simple diagnosis of the, of the treatment plan or a diagnosis of the orthodontic treatment, you would actually end up in a position where you can't achieve your orthodontic aims and objectives. So in most cases, I would say complex cases are mainly... Uh, the, the one that is commonly referred would be an any skeletal discrepancy, let's say a class 2 or class 3 skeletal discrepancy, which require orthodontic surgery. A uh, complicated case would include uh, impacted teeth, uh, which is really, really difficult to actually upright and bring down. And complex cases would be something that uh, require a lot of uh, anchorage demand. Uh, anchorage demand in the sense of uh, you think of three dimension vertical, uh, horizontal and also sagittal. So if in your orthodontic plan you can actually plan, uh, you diagnose properly and then you can plan out your mechanics, uh, then you on, only then you know that the treatment is actually complicated or not. Uh, it's not that you do the treatment and then once the treatment fails, uh, then only you know the uh, complexity of the case. I see. Yeah. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, that's all we have for the case-based questions for today. Before we end the video, let's get into a bit of fun. Uh, we have a few questions for this rapid-fire round. I'll ask you 10 questions and all you have to do is answer them as fast as you can. Alright, sure. Alright, um, let's get started. So. What's the first thing you do in the morning when you wake up? First thing I do... Oh no, <laughs> I'm lost. <laughs> what do I do? First thing I do is uh, probably eat my breakfast and have a cup of coffee. Alright, so if not an orthodontist, what would your dream career be? Uh, I would probably be an engineer if not a dentist. Interesting. <laughs> so if you could learn any language in one week, what would it be? Uh, I don't know, maybe because I actually studied in India and I regretted not learning Tamil actually. I see, okay. <laughs> so, who is the person that inspires you? Um, I would say, uh, for now, my parents. That's very nice. Uh, describe yourself in three words. Uh, well, I'm bad at this, sorry. <laughs> um, Motivated, 
discipline and a little bit of OCD. Okay. <laughs> Cats or dogs? Dogs. All right. Do you have any secret talents? Um, no, I don't. <laughs> Honestly, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Uh, what is your least favorite thing about orthodontics? The least favorite thing about orthodontics is the timing of orthodontics because it's a really, really long treatment. Mm -hmm. yeah. But otherwise, it's, it's, it's quite fun. That's good. <laughs> so how do you usually spend a day off? I would prob uh, now, I would spend my day with my family because I, uh, I have two children now and a wife, so I would uh, try my best to spend time with them whenever I can. That's nice. So if you could go back in time and give your past self some advice, what would you give? I would say hmm, to my past self, uh, I mean, continue doing what you like doing, which uh, I'm happy where, where I am currently, actually. That's so just continue doing what you're good at and, and, and go ahead with that. That's so nice. Um, so that's all we have for today's episode. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for watching. Thank you, Doctor, for joining us today and for sharing these very interesting cases and your very valuable insight. Uh, we hope to see you again on case-based learning with experts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.